Our Bible reading this morning is John 3, John chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. Now, when I was in Canberra yesterday, I was driving round to where Greg lives after visiting Rob, and there was a church there, and I thought, I wonder what's on that notice board, because Wayne always looks and says, there's usually a lot of rubbish on them. <laughs> His wife does too. Yeah, but like when that. I looked, it was the last verse of our reading this morning, and I thought, good on them. Good on them, yes. So, yes. so remember that when we read the last verse. John 3, <coughs> verses 1 to 17. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time in his his mother's womb, and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. For that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly I say to you, We speak that what we know and testify what we have seen and you do not receive our witness. If I had told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the man, of, the son of man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up, that whoever, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. Thank you, Paul. In 1919, a lady called Leela Morris, of whom I know absolutely nothing, wrote a hymn which became the signature tune for the Scottish Festival Male Voice Choir. Would you like to hear it? Yeah. Good choice. The Saviour has come in his mighty power and spoken peace to my soul. Oh, my soul, the heart. 
Sheba came to visit Solomon yes. and saw all the wonders of his court and went back and said, the half was not told me. In other words, everything that was said about it was fantastic, but it was even more fantastic than what I was told. So Leela Morris uh, wrote those words, the half has never been told uh, into the words of that wonderful hymn. I hope that that uh, stirs uh, some joy in your heart this morning. <clears throat> and perhaps if you want to, Sneak off to YouTube and find it for yourself and play it again, learn the words. There's three fabulous verses. I don't know anything about that lady, nothing at all. I just know that, you know, she wrote this fantastic hymn. Yeah. All right. So, <clears throat> for the last five Sundays, we've been considering the theme of the last days, as is our usual August practice. It's been a wide ranging examination in which we have ended up examining the three possible explanations for the myriad of passages in the Old Testament and in Jesus' teaching concerning the concept of kingdom. As much as I would have liked to have fully explored the subject, in four Sundays available to me, I always had in the back of my mind that I was also going to be preaching for the first two Sundays of September, and that if I needed, I could extend our meditations into those two Sundays as well. I mean, it's not like I haven't done that before, have, is it? And it's not like I haven't already done it, is it? Because I have. So this morning, for our sixth message on the subject of the last days, at least this time around, on the second Sunday of September, and there's one more message to go, I might add, first Sunday in October, we'll revisit this theme one more time before going somewhere else. I want to jump right into the great paradox of Jesus' first coming. You may not think there is one. But I can assure you there is. And I want to tell you what it is and I want to jump into examining it and thinking about it. The first paradox and the great paradox of Jesus' first coming is why did he make all those kingdom signals and then not carry out any of them? I don't know if you've thought about that. But you should be thinking about that. And I hope this morning I can provide at least a couple of answers. Now, I'm going to discount completely the kingdom template so rampant in Christendom today that Jesus' behaviour and teachings were wholly consistent with his crucifixion and death because he wasn't actually offering a physical kingdom to Israel anyway. I trust that I have sufficiently debunked that myth already over the last five Sundays. So, as we look at Jesus' words and works we need to adjust ourselves to the fact that he certainly sent some mixed messages. So let's look at some of them. For example, let's think first of all about the Sermon on the Mount. Here Jesus outlines the conditions for blessing. I remember when I was little, I must be 10 years old, they used to have a thing called the Sunday School Exam. Did anyone do the Sunday School? Who did the Sunday School? And you always had to memorize a passage of scripture. 
I remember at least memorising the important verses in Isaiah 53. And I remember memorising the first eight or ten verses of uh, Matthew chapter 5 as well as part of the exam. I don't know how I did in that exam. I should have done all right. My dad was an open-air preacher. You know, I, I hesitate to think about what the results might have been, but I think we were pretty smart kids. I think we probably would have done pretty well. So the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus outlines the conditions for blessing. <clears throat> he says in Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit what? Yeah. The earth. Hmm. Interesting. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now that doesn't sound very much like what Peter and James and John uh, and Paul teach in the epistles, does it? This is blessing conditional upon performance. If you are persecuted, you will be blessed. If you are a peacemaker, you will be blessed. If you are meek, you will inherit the earth. Action and blessing. That doesn't sound very much like what the epistles teach us, which teach us that we are blessed because <laughs> we are the kingdom of God and we are in the kingdom of God. That sounds a lot like the law, in fact, doesn't it? If you obey the law, you'll be blessed. If you disobey the law, you won't. He said in verse 11, Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophet, <coughs> so persecuted they the prophets who were before you. That's pretty Jewish in context too, isn't it? If you think about it. He says in 6.14, If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men your tre their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Does that sound like <coughs> the New Testament epistle template of forgiveness, of repentance? It doesn't sound very much like it to me. In 7.13, he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. That's a little worksish, isn't it? Compared to what we have in the Gospel. He says in 7.21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father which is in heaven. So doing the will of the Father is the key to the kingdom, he says in 7.21. In 22, he says, Many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name, and I will declare to them I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The first question that should come to your mind is, in what day? He's plainly speaking here of a judgment, which judgment is he addressing here? That some people will say, Lord, I did all these good things at a judgment. And Jesus will say, well, they don't count for anything to part. So here is reward tied to performance. Let's talk about sending out the 12. When he sends out the 12 in 10, 15, a couple of chapters on, we read... Jesus sent them out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter the city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. <coughs> Why, in a gospel context, is Jesus sending out the disciples and saying, Don't take the gospel to the Samaritans. Don't take the message to the pagans. Just go and talk to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That seems very restrictive, doesn't it? And then in the same discourse, now we've looked at this already, remember we've been looking at Matthew in the context of preparing for the kingdom. He says in 1021, Now a brother will deliver up brother to death, and a father his child, and the children shall rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. Most assuredly I say to you, you will have not gone through all the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Where does that fit post-Pentecost? Where does that fit in the context of the preaching of the gospel 
where the very first thing that happens is that proselytes from all Gentile countries, 17 of them at least, go back from Jerusalem at Pentecost with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and take it back to pagan people. Admittedly, they're Jewish proselytes, but they take the gospel back to the places that they come from. Now, these are just a few samples of what is unquestionably law-based teaching from the lips of Jesus. Not to consider, as we already have, that this is clearly tribulation teaching that he is saying here. Now, commentators and expositors have twisted these words around to give them a gospel spin. But the simple reading of these and all of Jesus' teaching is, actions come first and they will determine righteousness. And righteousness will determine blessing. Whereas the gospel says, faith and righteousness come first, they will show in good works and actions which will lead to blessing. Now that's not the same sequence. It's not even close to the same sequence. So we might ask then, <clears throat> did Jesus teach at all in new covenant terms, in what we call, what I call post-Pentecost terms? Remember that Jesus is the messenger who will save his people from their sins. His message is to the covenant people of Israel. Did Jesus at any time move out of that mode in his teaching? Well, yes, he did, but only a couple of times, and I want you to look at them with me this morning. The first is in John 4. I'm sure you know this story off by heart. I'm sure you can probably quote sections of it off by heart. We don't have time to expound the whole woman at the well passage this morning. It's a sermon all in its own. But in a wide-ranging discussion with the Samaritan woman, when the subject of religion and whose was right was brought up, the woman says to me in 419, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. <coughs> Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. So she starts a religious fight with Jesus. Our forebears said, this mountain is the mountain to worship. And you Jews say, that mountain is the mountain to worship. What have you got to say about that? Jesus refuses to take her back to Jeroboam and the division of the nation, which, well, he could have done, because that's where the whole worshipping here instead of Jerusalem came from. But he doesn't. Instead, he replies in 421, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. Now, we know those words. We understand them in a gospel context. We quote them in a gospel context. But it's a pretty important statement, not the least because many of the millennial prophecies quite clearly say that the whole world will worship the Father and Jesus in Jerusalem. Micah says, people shall flow from all places up to Jerusalem to worship the Messiah. But Jesus says to the woman, the time is coming when not here on that mountain and not there will you worship God. Well, that's different to what Micah says. Why is it different? What's he saying here? Jesus points to a coming time when location, not to mention race or heritage, will be irrelevant to worship and that surely prefigures the church age. We are meeting in Goulburn, in the main street, in a borrowed hall. Does it matter where we meet? To worship the Lord? No. Location is not important. It's the worship that's important, and it's who is being worshipped that is important. He develops the point further <clears throat> while defending the importance of Jerusalem over Samaria. In 422, he says, You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So he's going to make that point because she's technically wrong in what she says. But then he moves on and says, But the hour is coming, and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So again, he divorces locality from worship and moves it into a spiritual environment where locality is not important, but spirit and truth are the keystones. And we must note that this discourse was a private, one-on-one -on -one meeting. John tells us that the disciples had gone to town to shop. Only Jesus and the woman were at the well. 
When the disciples returned, they were astonished that Jesus was talking to her at all. Look at verse 27. At this point, the disciples returned and they marveled that he talked to the woman, but they did not question the fact. We read, yet no one said, why, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? The woman, meanwhile, convinced about the truth of what Jesus has said, returns to the city to tell the people of the city about the meeting and she finishes her testimony of this meeting with these words. Could this be the Christ? So she's convinced. She's uncoupled worship from Samaria or Jerusalem. And she's thinking now that something different is coming, which is not going to have any relevance to that or to that, but something different altogether. Jesus has planted these thoughts in her mind. <clears throat> now clearly here, Jesus drops the kingdom paradigm and speaks to her of our experience in the Christian faith. That the woman was still speaking about the Christ seems to indicate she may or may not, may or may not have fully grasped the significance or meaning of what Jesus had said. That said, we certainly have no excuse not to. It's very clear what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not preaching the Sermon on the Mount to the woman. Jesus is preaching worshipping God in spirit and in truth to the woman, a different message altogether. Just one chapter earlier, the passage that we read, Jesus does the same with Nicodemus. Now here is a passage which most of you can quote off by heart. If you can't, you should. Jesus lifts the veil on the Pentecost gospel, again in private, one-to-one -one with Nicodemus. Now Nicodemus, remember the story tells us, is a Pharisee. He later defends Jesus when Jesus is being questioned by the rest of the Pharisees. Nicodemus sticks up for him. But he is a genuine seeker after truth, not like his hard-hearted peers. His opening words are full of respect and actually ask no question at all. His opening words are, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. I've often thought it's not necessary for us to know, but wouldn't you just love to know what he was going to say next? Wouldn't you just love to know what he was going to say? So on the basis of that, Rabbi, can I ask? Jesus never gives him a chance to ask the question, does he? Jesus straight away says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. <clears throat> now, brethren, you know your scriptures. Tell me where else the words born again appear. Tell me where they appear in the Old Testament. Never. No. Tell me where else they appear in all of the rest of Jesus' preaching. Never. So here, in a private conversation at night between an earnest unusual Pharisee and Jesus Jesus tells him something that no one else has ever heard unless a person is born again he cannot see the kingdom of God this isn't if you're good you'll get blessed this isn't if you're a peacemaker you'll inherit the earth this isn't if you're meek God will bless you this is unless you are born again you will not see the kingdom of God that's our message that's the church's message that's Pentecost message, isn't it? Absolutely. Cannot possibly be anything else. Now we know these words very well, but we ought to take a moment to think about how utterly strange and confusing they would have been to this well-taught son of the old covenant. Nothing in the teachings of Moses or the Psalms or the prophets said such a thing. Nothing in the rest of Jesus' teaching said such a thing. The literal wording here is born from above. What in the law prepared Nicodemus to digest that and understand its meaning. The law is about thou shalt, thou shalt not. The law is about offerings and sacrifices and feast days and holy days. The law is about what to do if your neighbor's ox falls in a hole in your ground. How much you have to pay to compensate. What you have to do if someone has leprosy. It's all about that sort of stuff. Here, Jesus is saying, let me shift you left and up into a different dimension altogether and tell you this one important truth. Now, Nicodemus is out of his depth instantaneously, and we ought not to criticise him for being so. He's been just told something that he has no preparation to understand. 
Nicodemus resorts to trying to get more information. He says in verse 4, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter again into his mother's womb and be born? Now we should note here that although the literal translation of again is from above, clearly it also means again because that's what Nicodemus was saying. How can a man be born again? You know, I'm, I'm an adult man. How can I be born again? Now that's not what I meant, Jesus says. Verse 5. Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel. Interesting words of Jesus there, isn't it? Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Now again, this is not what Jesus is preaching in public. We have enough of Jesus' public preaching to compare that with this. And Jesus doesn't say this at the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus doesn't say this even to his disciples when he rescues them from the storm on the lake. Jesus says this in private, in the dark, with one earnest Pharisee. He tells him something which is only hinted at one other place, and that is with the woman at the well. It's very important for us to understand this. This more closely resembles the discourse with the Samaritan woman. And that happens soon after this event. But Jesus is not yet ready to relinquish the upper hand in this conversation. He reminds Nicodemus again of his religious heritage and position. And then accuses him and the rest of the Pharisees of not believing in him. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said to him, Are you a teacher in Israel and do not know these things? Now, that's a non sequitur. Of course he's a teacher in Israel. But of course he doesn't know these things. Why? Because this has never been said before. This has not been revealed before. This has not been preached before or demonstrated before. Of course he doesn't know. He says, most assuredly I speak, I say to you, we speak what we know and we testify what we have seen and you do not receive our witness. Now he's not rebuking Nicodemus personally, because Nicodemus has been a man of desire to know and has come to Jesus and sort of essentially put his heart on his sleeve and said, tell me, what's really going on? And Jesus has told him. But as the nation, and especially as the rest of the Pharisees, Jesus is saying, I have come from heaven. I've told you what you need to know and you don't want to hear it. <clears throat> now we should understand this about the Pharisees. It's very important for us to understand this. The Pharisees never, in their teaching, and the Sadducees, never said anything new. Their teachings were interpretations of what had already been said in Scripture and in other religious documents. So all they did was travel in the same circles that all the rest of the scribes and Pharisees, for generation after generation, had followed. And they interpreted their words. This is what we think Moses meant. This is what we believe <laughs> that Joshua said. This is what we believe that Zechariah means. Jesus comes from left field and says, I say unto you. Oh, hang on, that's different. Radically different. Is it any wonder the Pharisees were offended? We've been coming for generation after generation and saying, Zechariah says, and Joel says, then this bloke turns up out of the blue and says, I say unto you. You mustn't do that. We're not brave enough to do that. How come you can do that? You can see the reason for the hostility going on here. Jesus here and everywhere else speaks with authority, saying new things and speaking things of which Nicodemus could never have known. Things of heaven, things of his father and of spiritual realities. Jesus adds in verse 12, If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Now, brethren, can I say to you this morning, if you have unbelieving children, grandchildren, uncles, aunties, friends, cousins, acquaintances, here is the key to why they are what they are. It's a critical question here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, thinking back to what Jesus just said to Nicodemus, the Apostle Paul says, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Now you need to memorize that verse. You need to internalize and understand that verse and you need to use that verse. You need to have that in the back of the cranium when you're talking to people. 
and when you're witnessing to people about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to have an underlying understanding that unless God gives them understanding of what you are <coughs> saying, they are not naturally equipped to get it. Now, Nicodemus is a religious man. The text says he was a Pharisee. A man well taught in scriptures, but brethren, he is a natural man. He is approaching and seeking to understand the things of God with his human mind, unenlightened by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is fair to say, don't you understand these things? Now, of course, the answer is, of course, no, he doesn't understand these things. Why not? Because he is a natural man, and the things a natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, nor can he know them, because they are what? Spiritually discerned. And at this time, Nicodemus does not have that spiritual discernment. This was and is the default state, spiritual state, under the law. Sin was only covered, not forgiven. Joel the prophet himself put the outpouring of the Holy Spirit with its attendant blessings sometime in the future. It will come to pass after as I'll pour out my spirit upon all. Oh, that'll make the difference. I make all the difference. But right at the moment, Nicodemus is not just come to Jesus by night. Nicodemus is in the dark. Now, we understand Jesus is teaching perfectly, don't we? If you don't understand what Jesus is saying here in this passage, we need to talk later. Because you should be able to understand it because you should have the discernment of the Spirit of God within you through faith in Jesus Christ to be able to understand it. Even Jesus' disciples were regularly chided by him for their lack of understanding of what Jesus was saying. Even when he was speaking in terms of the law, which they knew. In Luke 9, 44, he says, Let these words sink down into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was hidden for them so that they could not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him what he meant. There's the answer to why the disciples spent three and a half years with Jesus and barely understood a single word he said. It wasn't because they were dumb. It wasn't because they weren't listening. It was because they were without the discernment of the Holy Spirit to key into that same spiritual channel that Jesus was working with and speaking when he preached. But here with Nicodemus, Jesus lifts the veil of heaven and reveals what Pentecost will be all about, the new birth through faith in himself. Now can I say one other thing here quickly? You all know people who claim to be spiritual, right? It's a disease these days and always a very spiritual person. You know, someone dies, it can be the biggest blackguard that's ever lived on the face of the earth, and someone, guarantee it, someone will pop up and say, oh, but he was a very spiritual person. You can be as spiritual as you like. If you don't have the Spirit of God, you're still a natural man and you're still in sin. That's the bottom line. Does Jesus lift the veil at any other time? Or were these two incidents, the woman at the well and Nicodemus, the only departure from the obedience to the law and reward template. Does he do it again anywhere else? Well, yes, he does. If you're following me in your physical Bible, turn to John 14. Let me set the scene here. <clears throat> While you're doing that, I'll grab some drinkable water. I apologize for that cheap shot. Sorry about that. I'll edit that out of the tent. Too. <clears throat> Let me set the scene here. Jesus has just celebrated Passover with his disciples. Judas has left to go to the scribes and Pharisees <laughs> to betray him. And we read in John 13, 33, him saying, Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. Now, this is not the first time that Jesus has foreshadowed the end of his life and the end of his earthly ministry. He has often spoken of his death and almost always with it of his resurrection. Straight after the, who do men say that I am, question. And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We read in 1620 in Matthew, from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. This explicit declaration of Jesus' messiahship by Peter seems to be the trigger for Jesus to reveal fully the different path he was taking to that which the disciples and the crowd thought he was going to take. Did the disciples think they were going to go on through into kingdom? 
Absolutely, I'm sure they did. And so did the crowd. <clears throat> the two other synoptic gospels record the same, but that was a little while ago. And now in just an hour or two, literally just an hour or two, Judas will return with the temple guard and he will be arrested and in fewer than 24 hours he will be crucified. This is, in fact, the last time that Jesus predicts his death. And as he leads into the last teaching of his disciples, minus Judas, he starts with a most unlaw-like statement. 13, 34. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have <coughs> loved you. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one for another. Note that, a new commandment. Ooh, think about that in the context of Moses and the law. Think about that in the context of the Pharisees only ever saying what someone's already said. A new commandment I give you. Is this the 11th commandment of the law? Or is this something left and up from that? Of course, it's left from up, isn't it? <coughs> Not this time, more about the Sabbath or about marriage or about any such thing, this is a new commandment, that they should love one another with the same love with which he has loved them. So let me ask you right at this moment, even with Judas gone, and just the trusted eleven listening, are these men capable, spiritually, <coughs> of loving one another as Jesus has loved them? No. Short answer, no. Why? Well, for the reasons we've just said. I'm sure they probably wanted to be able to. I'm sure they were fervently friendly with each other. <coughs> Two pairs of them were brothers. You expect there at least to be some brotherly love. But this new commandment was delivered to men who at that time were not spiritually equipped to obey it and carried out. These were still natural men, as Paul teaches us in 1 Corinthians. Now Peter deflects this too hard statement by saying, asking Jesus about where he's going. Verse 36 is in 13 still. Simon Peter asked and said, Lord, where are you going? Good old Peter. You can always rely on him to spoil the moment, can't you? you know? If something's got to be said and there's silence, Peter will step in with something. <coughs> where are you going? Jesus knows how to deal with this. He says, where I am going, you cannot follow me. Now, but you shall follow me afterwards. Again, wow, what did he just say? You can't come with me now, but you will follow me afterwards. Where's that in the law? Where's that in the law? Where's that in? Is that buried deep in Leviticus chapter 27, verse 8 or something? Is it? It's not there, is it? Of course it's not there. <coughs> but consideration of that gets lost in the flurry of the conversation. Peter thinks Jesus is going on a road trip. Verse 37, Jesus said, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Jesus, sadly, I'm sure, leaves the conversation unfinished with the prophecy of Jesus' denial. Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow until you are denied me three times. And then remember, because the chapter and verse divisions in our English Bible are not in the original language, without pausing for breath, <coughs> after saying that, Jesus opens his mouth and says, let not your heart be troubled. 14.1. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I am going, you know, and the way you know. This is the answer to Peter's question. This is what Peter really wanted to know, but hadn't, wait, hadn't waited to hear. But it is so deep and so different that from anything that the law would have preferred them to hear or understand, it's Thomas who asks the next question. Thomas then says, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Now, there's a sequence to this conversation, but on the one hand, there's the clarity of Jesus' knowledge. On the other hand, there's the disciples hearing stuff that all their religion, all their life, had not prepared them to hear, and they are completely at sea. They don't understand what he's saying. They don't get what he's about. We do. We should. Again, if you don't, we need to talk. There's no real comprehension of the depth of what Jesus has said, just as with Nicodemus and with the woman at the well. Just a question to, as it were, keep the conversation going. 
Jesus is very gracious in answering said, verse 6, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now we're in absolutely new territory. Jesus isn't saying no one gets into the kingdom without me. Jesus said no one comes to the Father but by me. That's a different story altogether. Surely a different story altogether. Certainly the prophets foretold Jesus' coming and his ministry and even of his death. But nowhere in the Old Testament would the disciples or even the best taught Pharisee have been able to find teaching like this. Jesus is with his trusted eleven and starting from there, with no prying eyes or treacherous ears present, he teaches for the next chapters on what the new covenant will be like, how it will be started, who will participate, what its consequences will be, and by example, how to pray in the new covenant. He presents the first treatise in the whole of the Bible on the subject of the Holy Spirit. When he will come, what he will do, how he will be evidenced, what his activities will be. The law only hints at the subject of peace, especially peace with God. Jesus lays out the whole doctrine in this chapter. He preaches about the true vine, chapter 15. Joy and love, what to expect when they will be very different people to what they are now and how the world will hate them because of that. He tells them of their imminent sorrow, but that it will be turned into joy at his resurrection. He ends chapter 16 with, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And then in 17, he prays for himself and for them before the temple guard arrives in 18 to arrest him. All of this in a window of time, a tiny little window of time, with only 11 men listening to something that's never been heard by human ear ever before, something which the Old Testament law in no way prepares them to hear. This is the new commandment. This is where we are going to be going from here as opposed to continuing on from where we are. And it's important, brethren, as New Testament Christians, for us to understand how fundamentally different the constraints of the Old Covenant are compared to the blessings of the New Covenant. So three times Jesus tells the woman at the well about the New Covenant. He tells Nicodemus about the New Covenant. And he tells his 11 faithful disciples about the New Covenant. For the rest, to the crowd... He preaches Old Testament law and righteousness and blessings as a result. Now, this is all very new stuff, brethren. I challenge any Bible scholar to read these chapters and say, oh, yeah, that's just like the Sermon on the Mount. Well, actually, no, this is utterly unlike the Sermon on the Mount in every possible respect. It's unlike anything else he has said publicly with the exception of two conversations that we've already examined, with the woman at the well and with Nicodemus. So, it seems that Jesus had two messages, one for the nation, calling for righteousness and repentance and offering blessing if these conditions were met, as had all the prophets, and one for his followers, offering spiritual salvation through faith in his impending death and resurrection. If we read the Gospels, and again, just let the words say what they are saying and don't read the Gospel back into the Gospels, this distinction, I believe, is very clearly visible. Very clearly visible. Can we make Jesus' words in the kingdom context fit in the church age with all its blessing? Well, yes, we can, but only by ignoring their primary message and application. And clearly... Jesus closed off any hope of the kingdom for that generation with his last words to the nation at the end of Matthew 23. I've quoted these verses a couple of times. It's important for us to understand the verses and the context. He says in 23.37 of Matthew, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who killed the prophets and stoned those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, he says, your house is left to you desolate. Now we cannot make that last sentence fit in any church age gospel context. Clearly he's talking about the physical nation and clearly, while it's still standing, he's speaking about the physical temple. That house over there, that is left to you desolate. He's already prophesied in the chapter before that it's going to be destroyed. 
He's already said that. But he also says in the last verse, For I say to you, you shall see me no more until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So the door is closed until. Not closed forever, just closed until. Now you've had to deal with kids, you know the deal. If it's closed forever, you tell them. Say, it's closed until I choose otherwise. That's a different story altogether. That opens up an entirely different set of opportunities. So was Jesus then being duplicitous, offering the kingdom to his generation when all along the plan was for the church and for the kingdom to come, but for generations, but not for generations, long removed from his own. Why did Jesus not announce the church program, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the new birth, the new revelation? Why did he not announce those things publicly? Three and a half years of ministry, and he only said it three times. Once to the woman at the well, once to Nicodemus, and once to 11 trusted disciples just before he was arrested, when he finished preaching in public. Well, no, he wasn't being duplicitous or dishonest, not for a moment. All through the nation's history, God had always offered the path of repentance and restoration, and if he did not come, there would be judgment dealt out. Jesus does the same. I suggested to you in preaching on Matthew chapter 12 and 13, and our brother Dean also expounded exactly the same passage with exactly the same intention. The blasphemy against the Holy Spirit in Matthew 12 seems to be the last straw in God's patience with the nation. <clears throat> and Jesus' teaching from then on takes on a harder edge of condemnation and judgment as a consequence of what they have just said and what they have just done. Just done. They probably did not foresee the consequence of saying he has a demon. But God heard and Jesus heard and Jesus said you're not getting off the hook for that one. That one I'm not going to forgive you for. I think it's very easy to see that his kingdom centric message takes on an increased and exclusive tribulation content after this watershed moment. And of course straight following that is Matthew 13 and the parables of the kingdom which are tribulation parables, not church parables. And we must not forget, this is the last point, we must not forget that after Pentecost, after the death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus, and the coming of the Holy Spirit, and the birth of the church, after what Jesus said to the woman at the well, and to Nicodemus, and to the disciples in private after the Last Supper, what he said to those people was in place. After Pentecost, God through Peter, graciously and with no prejudice, makes yet one last offer of the kingdom to Israel. After the healing of the lame man in Acts chapter 3, Peter preaches to the crowd a second time. This is the second sermon after the Pentecost sermon. He says in verse 17, Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as also did your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ should suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, listen, and he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom the heavens must receive until the times of the restoration of all things. Now there's several important phases of that message. First of all, Jesus absolves them of responsibility for Jesus' death. You did it in ignorance. Secondly, he tells them that all the prophecies about the death and suffering of the servant of Jehovah, Isaiah 53, for example, were fulfilled in the death of Jesus Christ, their Messiah. Thirdly, there is therefore only one course open to them, repentance and salvation in Jesus Christ with the promise that if they do, the times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. This is not a spiritual promise. This is perfectly in line with the prophecy of Joel, which we looked at a couple of weeks ago. And fourthly, if these conditions are met, then God will send Jesus Christ. Where? Well, plainly from heaven. To where? 
to earth. From the place where he is presently, waiting for the times of the restoration of all things. In other words, Peter fulfills the charter of every Old Testament prophet. He says, if the nation will repent, then God will be favorable and the kingdom will come. This is an astonishing offer given under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, given in good faith, although in real terms, given the hardness of Israel's heart, unlikely to be taken up. Nevertheless, God cannot be held to blame for Israel's failure to have its kingdom 2,000 years ago. God cannot be held to blame for that. So if God offered the kingdom again in good faith, and surely by the wording, separate from the already in place church program, where does this leave the other stream of Jesus' message? And what was going on in the streets of Jerusalem on that day and onwards? Peter and the disciples are out in the streets preaching a new gospel, loving one another, repentance, faith in Jesus Christ, baptism as a sign. Where does that leave all of that? Is Peter being duplicitous? Is Peter doing the same thing that people accuse Jesus of saying? If you can have both of them, you know, they're both on offer, but really you're only going to get one of them. Is Peter doing that? Of course he's not. That's because there's something else going on here that we need to understand. And that is what the Bible calls the mystery program. And we've run out of time. <laughs> so we're going to look at it on the first Sunday of October. So I want you to think about that. Peter is out there preaching the gospel, our gospel, the same one that we preached 2,000 years later. But he's saying to the Jews, if you repent, if the nation repents, the Messiah can come right now. Now, clearly both can't happen, one or the other. What is Peter getting at? Why is Peter saying that when now 2,000 years down the track we know that it didn't happen? Why is Peter saying that? Well, there's an answer to it. It's in Scripture. We're going to find it, but we're not going to look at it this morning because, as I said, time's gone and Trisha's got to go too. <laughs> Let's quickly pray so Trish can go and fulfill her family obligations. <laughs> Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit who turns us from natural people who do not understand the things of God to spiritual people who can look at the scriptures and say, oh, that's what he meant. Makes perfect sense. Father, we thank you for the enlightenment of your spirit. Bless us as we seek to understand your word, as your spirit shows us what it means and leads us, as we were promised by Jesus himself, into all truth. Father, we thank you for these blessings and we pray that you would bless us as we continue to think about these things. Help us, Lord, to serve you faithfully this week and to be a blessing to those around us. Help us to love one another as you have loved us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.